<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's so. Um, Scott, are we good to go? Scott's the most important person here. I'm not. <laughs> So I'd like to welcome you to tonight's Your Health Lecture Series. Tonight's lecture marks the 13th year of the series. Uh, I had the good fortune of being at the initial planning meetings for the series with leadership from Michigan State University College of Human Medicine and uh, leadership from NMU, where we discussed the possibility of uh, collaborating on a speaker series with a focus on featuring physicians and researchers who could speak on a wide variety of health issues and topics of interest to a broad audience, including, and, and that audience would include <clears throat> university faculty, staff, and students, physicians and staff from the hospital and other medical facilities, and of course, members of the market and surrounding communities. Uh, this series has been successful enough that it's expanded to now include Michigan Tech, Bay College, and Lake Superior State, uh, expanding the opportunity like the one that we're having this evening to communities throughout the UP. I'd also like to make sure that we thank the sponsors of, the, sponsors of this series that include Northern Michigan University, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine, UP Health Systems Marquette, and the Superior Health Foundation. Uh, so it's now uh, my pleasure to turn the podium over to Dr. Keith English, who will introduce tonight's speaker. So it's a pleasure to be back in Marquette. I think this is the fourth or fifth of the Your Health Lecture series that I participated in. I've given two of the talks. I'm Keith English. I'm the chair of pediatrics and human development at Michigan State University, and I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician by background and training. Uh, this evening, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce our visiting speaker, member of my department, Dr. Ryan Thomas. Dr. Thomas is a Spartan through and through, and like anyone else in the audience who might be considering a career in medicine, he of course majored in astrophysics as an undergraduate at Lyman Briggs College at Michigan State University. He decided he, he wanted to become a physician, so he uh, matriculated at Wayne State University School of Medicine. He did his pediatric residency training next door there at Beaumont Hospital, and then moved on to the Cleveland to Cleveland Clinic, I'm sorry, to Case Western and um, uh, Rainbow Babies were uh, one of the leading institutes in the country for pediatric pulmonology, where he did his fellowship training in pediatric pulmonology. Luckily for Michigan State University, we were able to recruit Dr. Thomas back to Michigan State University in Lansing when he completed his fellowship training. He joined the faculty as an assistant professor, and he's now the director of the Division of Pediatric Pulmonology, Allergy, and Immunology at Michigan State University in the College of Human Medicine. He's also the director of our Cystic Fibrosis Center. He's had a long-standing interest in asthma and the mechanism of asthma, the immunogenetics of asthma. He did research on asthma during his uh, fellowship training uh, at Rainbow Babies. Subsequently, he has been doing research on cystic fibrosis in the microbiome as a member of our department. Ryan also plays an important role as the liaison for our pediatric residents in Lansing to help them develop opportunities and scholarship and research uh, during their residency training. So Ryan is uh, very passionate about the topic he's gonna to talk to you about tonight. He's gonna to tell us about asthma, really the most important and common of chronic diseases in children with a tremendous uh, impact on the health and well-being of our children uh, and their families. It's one of the children having problems with asthma is one of the leading reasons why adults miss their job, uh, lose their job, et cetera. It can really have a devastating impact on the family. So tonight, Dr. Thomas is gonna talk to us about asthma care, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Ryan. All right, well, I'd, I'd like to thank those of you who came in person. I understand there's a fair number of people watching online too. And, you know, thank you for the invitation to come and talk about this. 
Um, the objectives today are really to look at the risks of using as needed strategies for asthma management, um, discuss medication adherence and asthma, which is really important, and discuss successful sort of as needed asthma medication strategies, no conflicts. And so this is really what the talk is, but it didn't fit on the flyer. So I had to change the order of things. And, um, and so really I'm just talking about using medications for asthma as needed. What are uh, the ways that we can use to manage asthma um, when we're just having uh, care when the symptoms are present. And then we're gonna start by looking at some of the things that are not so good about it and then end with some of the ways it's changing to make some of this care a little bit better. So, you know, there's a lot of people who will be um, who maybe or may not be that familiar with asthma in attendance today. So we're just gonna kind of start from the beginning. Asthma is a chronic inflammatory disorder. And that's, that's really important. When most people think of asthma, they think about you know, the airway tightening, the difficulty breathing, the wheezing, the coughing. And that starts as chronic inflammation. And then this, manif this inflammation manifests as um, reversible airway narrowing, which is the tightening I was just talking about, and respiratory hypersensitivity, which is the airways of people with asthma are extraordinarily sensitive to outside factors. Things like exercise, cold air, dry air, pollen, thunderstorms. There's a variety of different things that people with asthma will respond to that someone without asthma um, would, not have any, have any, would not have any effect. And what this leads to clinically is these recurrent episodes of coughing, wheezing, chest tightness, um, shortness of breath, and, um, and then this tends to be associated with widespread and variable airway narrowing. And that is usually reversible. It can be reversible spontaneously, especially in things like exercise, where um, generally stopping exercise, the symptoms will go away. Uh, but with treatment, usually we can, we can improve this as well. And um, this is a really, really important thing in the care of pediatrics. One in 10 children have asthma. And it is uh, the most common chronic condition in children and ine inevitably one of the top two or three reasons for hospitalization amongst children. So this is something that we really have to do better because a lot of these things potentially could be prevented if we could find better therapies. And so this is sort of a picture of what I was talking about, figure one being the normal airway. And you see um, nice relaxed airway muscles, the airways are nice and open. And you can see easily how easily air would be able to move throughout the airways. But in, a, in acute asthma, you have this variety of things that happen. You have the bronchospasm that narrows the airway. You have the mucus that builds up within the airway. And then you have swelling and inflammation of the tissue surrounding the airway. And you can see how that leads to a really drastic narrowing of the airway and limits the ability of people to breathe when this is happening. So how do we treat asthma? And this is sort of a, a grid that um, think we can think about both the things that we want to control and the different parts of asthma that, that um, and the different ways we can do it. So we use bronchodilators to open up the airways to treat that muscle spasm within the airways. And then we use steroids to control the inflammation. And this is really the two-pronged strategy of a large majority of asthma care is you control the inflammation, you control the tightening of the airways. And when we think about what are our traditional medications that we use as needed for asthma, um, we have albuterol, which is a, a bronchodilator. It relaxes the smooth muscle in the airways and allows the airways to open up. And we have uh, the oral steroids, prednisone, dexamethasone, IV steroids. There's a variety of different ways it can be done that can be used to control the inflammation. And so that's really the cornerstone of when we're talking about asthma attacks, asthma flares, stuff like that. These are the things that we use to manage these, these, uh, these, these things. So what are the problems with doing this? If we have medicines for this, why, why do we need to do something any better? Um, the use of albuterol, three albuterol canisters in any one year period, it predicts an increased risk of uh, a severe asthma exacerbation. And that's only one puff a day. So that is not a lot of albuterol use. And, and the reason for this is albuterol is one of the medications that's susceptible to tachyphylaxis, which is the more you use it, the less it works. The receptors that this works on on the cell, get, as they're being overstimulated, get pulled into the cell and then there's nothing left for the medicine to act on anymore. So some of the kids that I see are the absolute sickest are ones who've been using their albuterol frequently over the course of year, years and weeks and months or, and they just, you go to treat them when they're sick and there's just nothing left there to respond to. 
And there's good evidence that only 35 to 40% of children with asthma can maintain their asthma with albuterol alone, control of their asthma. And there is not really evidence to support albuterol only recommendation. What's sort of interesting is prior to the development of albuterol as a way to treat asthma, we had all sorts of IV and systemic medications that had tremendous side effects and were very poorly tolerated and, and didn't work that well. And then albuterol came along and it just worked so much better than everything, anything we had. It became the standard of care. And so that was the cornerstone of what asthma care was built off, where if albuterol wasn't good enough, we started adding other things. But nobody really went back to look and say, well, are we happy with how, how good this is doing just as a baseline therapy for asthma? And then they went back and looked at this. They did um, a post hoc analysis and some data and found that children with what we would consider the mildest form of asthma, intermittent asthma, we could have the risk of uh, serious exacerbations by adding an inhaled steroid to their regimen. Um, and this has been supported by further research, which suggests that, you know, maybe our, our baseline asthma care is flawed just from the, the very beginning. And so, and, and, you know, the ugly part of this is um, this loss of control leads to lots of problems to kids with asthma. Um, systemic steroid use, which is associated with side effects, um, as I'll talk about below. Uh, ER visits, hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and even death. Um, you know, 5,000 people a year die of asthma in the United States. And, you know, it's thought of being sort of this benign thing, but that's, uh, that's, a, that's a lot of people. And, and when we have an opportunity to do better in something at this common, you know, we, we should try and seize every opportunity that we have. And um, they also have decreased lung function, uh, exercise tolerance issues, which may limit their ability to do sports and things, which is really important in kids. Uh, sleep quality, asthma, for whatever reason, is generally worse in the middle of the night or early morning. So frequently, kids will be coughing themselves awake, oftentimes multiple times a week. And this leads to you know, poor quality of life in these children. Uh, you know, Not being able to go out to recess and play with your friends because you're coughing and wheezing is a pretty miserable thing for a second grader or a third grader. Feeling different from your friends is something uh, that you know, is hard at any age. And so um, and so it, asthma it has a lot of effects on children more than just sort of the physical effects that we think about. Um, we know that there's a linear relationship between missed days of school and out, uh, school performance as kids get older. And asthma is one of the most common reasons that children meet school or miss school. So uh, these are, there's a lot of reasons we, we need to do better. And systemic steroids, which are the sort of the cornerstone rescue therapy. If, if what we're doing is not working, well, we always have this sort of backstop of prednisone or something like that. You know, it has, it has side effects, both minimum, minimal, but some are really important. Um, vomiting, mood swings, uh, behavioral issues, sleep disturbance in children. A toddler loaded up on prednisone is a very unpleasant thing to deal with in the household. Uh, they, they don't sleep, they don't stop moving, and it's, uh, they're, they're prone to temper tantrums on top of the normal. <laughs> so it's, uh, these are all things that are really important. Um, there's a dose-dependent decrease in bone mineral accretion in children, which increases their risk of osteoporosis and when they get older. And then in adults, we see osteoporosis, increased risk of fracture, high blood pressure, obesity, type 2 diabetes, ulcers, and cataracts. And these sort of behave in a, a, a dose-dependent fashion. And these risks are small, but they're, they're there. And if, and if we can reduce them by, by finding other ways to treat this, then you know, that, wouldn't that be wonderful? And so we know that these traditional as-needed treatments for asthma are not adequate to control asthma in a majority of people with asthma. And that this loss of control carries risks, as does the treatment of these exacerbations with the systemic steroids. And we really need something better. And so the first thing that came out is these things are, the, well, can we prevent these asthma attacks? Can we prevent these episodes? And this led to the development of asthma controller medications. And for our controlling the uh, airway tightening, um, the bronchoconstriction, we have these long acting bronchodilators. So they act very much like albuterol, but they last 12 to 24 hours. And then for controlling inflammation, we have inhaled steroids. And these are really low dose inhaled steroids. You use an inhaler for a whole year, it's about the same amount as you would in a typical steroid burst for loss of asthma control. 
So it's really allowing you to do a very small amount of medication over a very long period of time and get better control. And then the last thing is these leukotriene inhibitors, um, which I'm not going to talk a lot about today, but those are another way of controlling the inflammatory cascade and asthma. The problem with them is they're more associated with side effects and they're less effective. So um, we're trying to concentrate on as much as possible on things that work better. And these asthma controllers are amazing. I mean, they're a really excellent option. They're really low doses of medicine. They work for you know, a relatively long time. They're incredibly effective. Um, they reduce symptoms, albuterol use, improve quality of life, and decrease, and decrease exacerbations. At lower medium doses, we can get control of children with asthma 70 to 90% of the time. So they really do a wonderful job. Side effects are really rare. A lot of them are just related to, you know, the topical deposition of these steroids in the mouth and throat. Um, and so just by brushing your teeth or rinsing out your mouth, you can prevent these a vast majority of time. In the you know, decade I've been taking care of asthma, I've seen it only a handful of times. Um, there are some growth changes, as much as a decrease in a half inch of adult height has been reported in some studies, but that's largely in higher doses. And um, we really don't see much of that anymore. Usually if we see any changes in height gain, they, get, they, caught, they catch up on their own without stopping the medicine. It's just sort of an adaption period. And then very rarely we can see some adrenal suppression, which will lead to serious consequences, but I've seen that once or twice in my career. So these are rare things and asthma attacks are a common problem. And so when we look at sort of our risk versus our benefit analysis, it's pretty easy to decide what we wanna do. And then there's these uh, things called spacers, which are plastic tubes that go on to the end of an inhaler and they let infants and small children use inhalers where you wouldn't expect them otherwise to be able to. And that further decreases the side effects because it decreases the amount of medicine that lands in the mouth and throat. So why don't we just use these in everyone? No, there's some limitation to these. They're technique dependent. Um, almost 50% of patients will use improper technique with their inhaler. And different inhalers use different techniques. And the problem is when you're doing your inhaler wrong, you usually don't think you're doing your inhaler wrong. So it's not something you ever think to ask, like, oh, am I doing this right? And this poor technique um, impacts efficacy. Those who have um, you know, incomplete or inadequate technique are more likely to lose their control of their asthma or end up in the ER. And this technique can be proved with education, but this is time consuming. You know, this can take five, 10 minutes. And when oftentimes some primary care providers only have 15 minutes with a patient, this is a lot to ask when there's so many other things to go over. And these sort of teaching and education that really should be the cornerstone of what we're doing is not something that's well, you know, unfortunately, well, um, it's not reimbursed. It's something that you have to do because you want to make things better. And that creates this sort of push pull because the system just doesn't do a good job sometimes of prioritizing important things like this. Using these medicines is expensive. You know, these inhalers cost 200 to over $400 an inhaler, and most of them last a month. And this leads to an annual per person cost of asthma prescription medicines of being uh, $1,800 a year. And this is, a, this is a 2018 study, so I'm almost sure it's higher than that. And using medicines every day is hard. Um, most people will not use their daily asthma preventer as prescribed. There are several studies that have looked at this and then in even the most difficult to treat patients, the patients with the most severe asthma, only about two thirds of them filled the, their inhaler half of 50% of the time. Um, you know, another study, 12% of patients would report correct use of their inhaler and it estimated adherence in 16 to 32% um, over two years in another group. So a vast majority of patients aren't going to use these medicines, even if they work and you give it to them. And that's, you know, it's just, it's a hard thing to remember. It's a hard thing to prioritize. Taking a medicine every day when you feel fine and you aren't having any complications from it is just a hard thing sometimes to rationalize. And so I understand. And so, you know, what, what can we do, um, so here's a summary, I'm getting a slide ahead of myself. So they're safe and effective, but they're expensive and technique dependent. Is there a middle ground? And so we have some newer regimens that have come out really to the forefront in the last five years or so. And this will increase the number of people who are potentially eligible for these as needed asthma regimens. And it increases the efficacy of them. So more people will be eligible for them and they work better when we do them. And the two options that I wanted to talk about today is sort of the intermittent inhaled steroid therapy. 
Um, and then intermittent in the ICS lava. So that's a combination of the inhaled steroid and the long acting beta agonist. And, and these two met one version of these or another are really the cornerstone asthma controllers, but this is a way so we don't necessarily have to use them all the time. Um, <clears throat> so looking at intermittent steroids and mild asthma, in children less than four with three plus episodes of wheezing, Using, using inhaled steroids at the first sign of a cold led to a 33% reduction in oral steroid use. And if you're reducing the use to uh, oral steroids, you're reducing downstream hospitalizations and ER and everything else. In older children and adolescents, this has been shown to be a really good step-down therapy. So if someone's been really well controlled for six months for a year on their daily medicine, you think, well, maybe it's time we should try stepping, stepping you down, see if you need less medicine. Switching to one of these as-needed regimens reduces treatment failures by 30% versus stopping it altogether. These, these, these regimens don't work as well in kids with daily symptoms. If they're having a lot of symptoms with exercise or they're coughing at night frequently, you know, the daily regimen's probably still a better bet. But if it's these sort of discrete events like viral illness, which is the trigger of 90 to 95% of asthma attacks in children, um, you know, it's pretty easy, like, oh, you've got a cold, you start this, you start this medicine, you know, at the first sign of the sniffle, and we know it decreases your chance of, of losing control and having a bad asthma attack. In adults, as needed inhaled steroids, um, adults with mild asthma, as needed inhaled steroid treatments was equivalent um, in preventing ex exacerbations to a daily inhaled steroid therapy. Um, and really, modern, the modern asthma experts and consensus is the most important thing we can do is control asthma attacks, keep people at ER, keep them out of the hospital, keep them alive. And while it's not as effective at controlling these daily symptoms, sometimes we have to prioritize, well, what are the things that are most important when we're delivering care? And then we also have this as-needed inhaled steroid lava um, and these are medic medicines like Advair, Simbacor, Dulera, um, the people have seen used in the community for asthma. And there's two studies that looked in this, uh, the Sigma studies one and two, uh, very creative naming. And they, um, they were looking at non-inferiority for severe exacerbations compared to daily um, inhaled steroid use. And really they were prioritizing how do we stop asthma attacks? What is the best way to stop asthma attacks? And this is both in adults and children. And it avoids the need for daily inhaled steroids, which reduces expense, reduces side effects, um, reduces hassle for the patients. And they did say that you know these small differences in symptom control are probably probably not as important, and maybe we could overlook those if we can get a drastic uh, reduction in medication use. And so these were the three prongs of, of the trial in the Sigma-1 study. Um, the blue line is as needed terbutylene. This was done in Europe. And this is equivalent to albuterol we'd be using in the United States. And then the red line and the, um, is budesonide famotorol as needed. So that would be Simbacort. And then the budesonide maintenance was a daily inhaled steroid medicine. And you can see over the 52 weeks of the study, um, when we look at the probability of having a severe asthma attack, um, the risk was essentially the same in the red line and the black line, which says the two therapeutic regimens were um, no different. But it led to a 80% reduction in medication use and expense when you look over the course of the trial. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's pretty impressive. I wish all of our <laughs> medical studies had, had that kind of outcome. And then this was the second study, again, looking at the time to first severe asthma attack. And they looked at budesonide maintenance versus the as-needed budesonide famotorol. And you can see those lines just track with each other really closely, and there's no significant difference between the two. So you know, we have two large studies. Both of these studies had you know, more than 3,000, 4,000 patients in them. It really showed that this regimen in adults and older kids is equivalent in preventing asthma attacks. And if that's what we're most worried about, maybe this would be a good regimen to use. And so kind of looking at all of this in summary, um, mild asthmatics are still at risk for bad outcomes. And intermittent inhaled steroids prevent exacerbations in intermittent and mild uh, asthma. It is superior to using albuterol alone and probably or close to equivalent in using low dose steroids depending on the age group that you're, you're looking at. Um, and, and there is some data within the study that uh, using higher doses of the inhaled steroid when you're using it intermittently is probably a little bit better. Um, but it's not really imperative what dose it is as long as you're starting something. 
Um, these are not uh, appropriate choice for significant impairment, which is the asthma physician's uh, code for day-to-day -day symptoms. We think about asthma as impairment. How, long, how much is this impaired about your ability to live your life the way you want to live it? And then what is your risk, your risk of asthma attacks and how bad the asthma attacks are when you get them? The intermittent uh, ICS labar, ICS, even ICS albuterol combo may be the best option also for people who struggle to do something every day. It's better than doing albuterol alone. And if you know they're just having a hard time doing it for whatever reason, pick a regimen that's likely to work if they're only using it when they're sick. Um, Doing these regimens may increase the cost of asthma care though. And so that's an important thing to consider. Uh, an, an albuterol inhaler costs anywhere from 40 to you know, $80. And some of these medications are $300, $400 that we're talking about. And so that's a tenfold increase in the expense of your inhaler. And you know, for people with, uh, who don't have insurance and stuff like that, sometimes that's just not a feasible approach. Um, and then we really do need more pediatric data, especially on the ICS LABA combination medications, because the, these trials had a chunk of children 12 and up in them, but they were not, it was a sort of a small percentage of it. And so, you know, we want to try and push the community of asthma researchers and children to continue looking at this and make sure we're not, we're not missing anything. Um, some other relevant updates about asthma just for the community. Uh, it used to be, if I was going to talk about one of these medications, Simbicord or Advair or something like that, I would have to tell you that there was a black box warning for an increased risk of asthma-related death. And this circles back to the idea that if you're overusing these bronchodilator medicines, eventually they may, you may wear out the ability of the body to respond to them. And that has been uh, shown that in asthma, when you combine it with an inhaled steroid, that inhaled steroid pops those receptors back up onto the surface of the cell where they belong. And there's you know, several large studies looking at this have shown that this was not something that we need to worry about anymore. And in fact, this combination medicine is the most effective way of controlling asthma. If you had to pick one thing, this is what you wanna use. Um, and in the meantime, Singular Monolucast, which is the medicine that one of those um, leukotriene inhibitors I mentioned in briefly, is a medicine that had a black box warning attached to it. And then it, it, because it, we saw neuro, increased risk of neuropsychiatric effects, including suicide in teenagers. And this, so this is our worst performing asthma controller, and it has the most side effects associated with it. So I really try not to use it. The, the benefit of it, it's the one asthma medicine that's just a pill. And pills are a lot easier to do than inhalers. And so that is why it's been so popular within the community is that these meds um, are just so easy to do. You don't have to worry about technique or any of these things. And then they are cheaper than the inhalers as well. So there's benefits to it, but not when you're looking more strictly at just controlling the asthma. And now they're starting in more severe asthma. There's this thing called the SMART regimen, which is Symbacort as maintenance and rescue. Um, or which is the ICS from Motorol. And so that's where you use that medicine both twice a day and every four hours as needed. And that's something in moderate and severe asthma that's really becoming pushed to the forefront. It is now the recommended therapy in the newest as set of the asthma guidelines. Don't use it with um, ICS Silmeterol or Advair because that has about a two hour onset of action and which is not a very way to uh, rescue someone who's having shortness of breath. The um, Simbacort and the Dulera, it's about a 20 minute onset of action. Well, Albuterol itself is five to 10. So it's sort of a small difference. And it showed really, really um, excellent job of controlling exacerbations compared to using Albuterol as the rescue in people with more moderate severe asthma. And so this is the most recent asthma treatment step. And when we think about asthma treatments, um, at least in, in children, it's this very stepwise approach where you make an initial assessment, you decide what step of therapy is appropriate. If you're not controlling their asthma, you move up a step. If you're not controlling your asthma, you move up a step. And so in children less than four, you will see that this is the thing they changed is they have said at the start of all illnesses in children with recurrent wheezing, they should start a daily inhaled steroid, which is really completely different than anything we've been doing for asthma in 30 years. Um, in older children, five to 11, um, the thing to see here is this sort of step three therapy is you start with the low dose inhaled steroid every day. And then the next step is that SMART regimen that I mentioned, we're using it as both maintenance and rescue, where normally this would have been reserved for more like a five or six step therapy. So it's really something that we're using sooner because it has that much more efficacy and, and a lot of safety data behind it now. And then for people 12 and up, um, the big changes are 
even in someone who is mild persistent asthma, which we would traditionally have been someone that should have been on a daily inhaler, especially someone who's mostly just having issues with illnesses and asthma attacks and stuff like that, you can still use an as needed regimen amongst, amongst these patients and these children. And then once again, in, in step three, you go right straight to that smart regimen again. And so this really, they have not, the, the United States has not updated their asthma guidelines in over a decade. And so that's why you're seeing such big changes in, in, in what's being done. And, you know, these came out in December of 2020. And we know, unfortunately, it can take up to 10 years for new consensus recommendations to trickle out into the community. And so, you know, my hope is today that my talk maybe will accelerate that a little bit, a little bit up here. And that's it. You know, the, the one thing I know about talks is you want to make sure they end on time or early. And so I was hoping to do that today. And so if there's any questions, I, was, I want to make sure I had plenty of time to answer those. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, what is the rate of still treating with a Montelukast? Is that still done pretty frequently or is it almost? I, I think it's all? still being done pretty, pretty frequently in primary care yeah. settings. I, I think it has been for decades the go-to um, for asthma care because it's such an easy thing to prescribe. Yeah. Um, and it also works for allergies too. So they think, well, if someone has asthma and allergies, it's sort of a two bird, one stone thing. But um, you know, obviously when we're talking about things like suicide, uh, it's, it's, it's something we want to be really careful about. And it's something every physician should be warning, especially teenagers about if they're starting that medication, because if they, they, they start to have changes in their mental health, they need to stop it right away. Thank you. You're welcome. I was just going to comment that I see very little reason to use that drug anymore for yeah. asthma. You yeah. have these new regimens, more data, safer, more effective. Yeah. So I don't, I don't see why that drug should be used much uh, for asthma anyway. Um, do we have any evidence that people are following these new guidelines? Obviously, with the COVID restrictions and fewer respiratory viruses in kids for a while, you had your overall asthma admissions plummeted. Yeah. Uh, are people using these new guidelines or do we know? I have not seen much use. So uh, to speak to just how much things plummeted while we were doing the distancing and masking, we had a 90% reduction in asthma ER visits at our, hosp our local hospital. I mean, if, if you had asthma between, you know, May of 2020 and the fall of 2021, it was, it was the, probably one of the better years for your asthma control because you get rid of those respiratory viruses that are a major trigger of asthma exacerbations. It was amazing how different my job was. Um, and so, and, and we have not seen much adaption, I think, of this in the community. And, and I think, um, you know, my area where we have pediatric pulmonology, you know, more readily available, I think for some of these things, there's a little bit of nervousness and if they think, well, maybe we should do it, they just, they just send them to me. But, you know, in, in an area up here where the near, nearest pediatric pulmonologist is probably at least three hours away, you know, th these are really useful tools for, um, getting better asthma control in, in a, a different way while reducing cost and um, treatment burden and uh, side effects. So hopefully we'll start to see more adoption of this soon. And the other thing is, 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 is more expensive to do these. And inhalers are expensive when we're using a lot more of them. Um, if when you're talking about the people who would have just been doing albuterol by itself in the past. And so that is something that I think is does give pause for some of this data that's coming out of Europe where you know they don't have to worry as much about the end cost to some of these medications to the consumer. Um, it's a little easier to make these recommendations. But uh, I think you know looking at the data, it, it speaks to itself from an efficacy standpoint. Thank you. Uh, uh, going back to the singular and, and Monte Lucas, uh, should it just not be prescribed anymore? And this is asking for somebody who has a you know bottle in my house. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think the, the odds of this are low. You know, this, this drug was on the market for 20 plus years, 30 years, and there were some hints of this. And they went back and studied it several times before they were able to find a signal in the data. Um, and the other thing is, in, in children with, you know, more moderate to severe asthma, um, sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes these are the steps you have, but it is something that when we go back and look at this sort of stepwise regimen, I, I don't think about using it until I'm getting to step five or step six, okay. because I think that's the, you know, where the, 
the risk benefit analysis starts to get a little bit more uh, equal. I'm so sad that this is it affects my household actually, um, <laughs> uh, um, and, and for adults actually. Uh, uh, but the, one, one question uh, that you didn't address today, but uh, there's been a lot said about the the hyper hygiene hypothesis and why there's so many increasing rates in, in asthma. If you could speak on yeah on that at all at all. Yeah, at all. so I can I I guess I should start at the beginning. So the hygiene hypothesis was something where when they looked at epidemiologic data of asthma, they found that there was a lot more asthma in the inner cities than there was out in rural communities. And then they looked specifically at, well, what are some of the differences in that? And even going as far as to go and, you know, uh, look at uh, pig farms and stuff like that. And they, they just realized that, um, you know, some, a lot of these uh, rural location, farm location, stuff like that, you had a lot more exposure to different sort of pathogens, bacteria, stuff like that. With the idea being that um, the type 2 immune system, which is the predominant part of the immune system that affects asthma, it was existed to um, take care of parasites, basically. And in, when you're not being exposed to things like that, perhaps the immune system starts to react to other things. I mean, asthma is, if you uh, want to simplify it, is your body thinks everything is worms and it's just trying to get rid of it. And it, it's... Uh, and so they started looking at this and, and there definitely seemed to be data to suggest that um, there was a relationship between things like um, bacterial exposure, bacterial proteins exposure and stuff like that, and the risk of developing asthma. And, um, you know, it's gotten a lot more complicated since that has sort of initially was postulated and studied. What we're seeing is that urban environments, as we've gotten a better understanding of the different types of pollution and contaminants and things in the atmosphere, both indoor and outdoor, there's a lot of other factors that may be playing a role in that. They're very pro-inflammatory. And then once you have the system sort of primed to re respond to things, and then you get something like a pollen or a virus or something like that, it's much more likely to lock onto that as being something. And so it was... It was something that was thought to be right, and then maybe not, and then yes again, and now I it just I don't think we know. And so it, it is as we've learned that their asthma um, is really complicated, and um, you know that some of these things like pollutions and and stuff like that, and air quality, how important they are to respiratory health. It's made a step back from that because we realize there may be some factors we weren't controlling for when we we're looking at some of that data early on. Dr. Th oh, excuse me, Dr. Thomas. I have a couple questions uh, online. We'll kind of go back and forth between online and in uh, in the room. So the first question I have from Ethel is: Did you say do not use abuterol and singular together? No, no. So um, you know, al albuterol is still. Um, a very appropriate rescue medicine. And you can see the PRN Saba, which is albuterol, um, is still for kids 12 and up, you're gonna be your go-to for really mild asthma and kids five and up as well. It's just in the little kids where we wanna think about adding steroids to it immediately. Um, and as far, I am not aware of any interaction between monolucast and albuterol. Um, so I, I think it, and, and again, in someone who's been on monolucast for years and not had a problem, th this is not the population that developed a problem. And so, you know, I wouldn't go home and necessarily throw it all away, but it is something that I think providers in the community should be aware of before they're starting this. So we can at least counsel people. I'll, I'll ask one more and then we'll open up to the room again. Uh, I would like a concise summary of the state-of-the-art recommendation for initial prescription of asthma. All right. Well, uh, I would say this slide is probably where I would start. Um, you know, I, again, the first thing is getting a good history, asking questions about how often are they having symptoms, how often are they using their medicines, how often are they coughing up, uh, coughing and waking up at night. How often are they needing steroids or sick visits or ER visits or stuff like that? And then there exists a table where you can qualify this as intermittent, mild, moderate, or severe. And then that helps you decide where you want to start. Usually for mild asthma, you start at step two, which is low dose inhaled steroids. So that would be budesonide or Pomacort 0.25 twice a day, or Flovent 110, um, or Flovent 44, two puffs twice a day. Um, 
and or there's a variety of other instilled inhaled steroids. Those are the ones I use the most in kids because those are the ones that are compatible with either a spacer or a child who's not going to coordinate a breath. But there's a variety of other things you can use. And so the inhaled steroid is is the go-to. It's the best one. When you're choosing between that or monolucas, it's the most effective and has less side effects. And then if that doesn't work, you bring up, you reevaluate and you step up. And usually they'd say, you know, every two to six weeks is when you want to be reassessing, did it work or did it not? If you wait six months, no one's going to remember, well, was it good? Was it not good? I'm not sure. And if you don't wait two weeks, you probably haven't gotten maximal effect of that. And so, um, and you want to reassess a lot. They say as often as every three months, you can consider stepping asthma medicines up and down. And that's because asthma is very seasonal, um, both with respiratory viruses and with various pollens and other triggers. And so there's some people who need medicine September through February, and then we get out of cold and flu season, and then they're fine. Other people need it spring through fall because there's pollens all over the place, and that's the problem. And, and asthma is really sort of a bucket of different things and different triggers, and every individual patient is different. And so you really want to be focused on what are the symptoms of problem, what are the triggers, and, and how do we adjust things to optimize control with the least amount of medicine possible. I hope that answered the question. I think you had a, I think you had a... Um, so it's really interesting to me to see that um, we get sort of a, um, resistant to the albuterol. Yeah. Um, and that when we add LABA as an alternative, a pre preventative, that the receptors pop back up. Um, has that ever been used or is it possible to use LABA to treat that resistance to albuterol so that you can go back to albuterol because it's the cheapest and sort of the fastest option and oh, probably yeah, the most yeah. accessible in smaller communities? So um, I, it, is, there, it has been studied. And what's interesting is albuterol or the short acting one does seem to be more prone to developing this sort of tachyphylaxis than the long acting agents are. And so um, when they looked at one of the studies looking at this, I didn't include the data on this, looked at either using um, albuterol and an inhaled steroid as rescue in adults or the long acting beta agonist um, or and uh, the inhaled steroid results. But one of the other arms in one of these studies was doing the albuterol every day along with your daily inhaled steroid. And they showed that that was worse than these intermittent regimens, but we don't see that in people who are using the long acting beta agonist. So for whatever reason, these two, these two medicines are just different enough where the long acting beta agonist is less likely, especially when you have the inhaled steroid, we just don't see the same sort of loss of effect. And so, um, you know, adding the inhaled steroid to the short acting beta agonist does help, but if you're using it regularly, you're still liable to run, run into trouble. So I have a question from Roberta online. Alternatives to monolucas for allergies? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm not an allergist, but I see a lot of kids with allergies because there's a lot of crossover between the two. And, and really it's, it's in, uh, nasal steroids and antihistamines. And, and you titrated that up and you, the dosing that you see on the bottle, you can go higher than that and sometimes get a treatment effect. And then usually if you're getting the point where it's like, eh, I don't know, are we going to add monolucast or not? It's you, you, you can't do it. These, these things are rare. You just have to make sure you warn people what, what the risks are. And, and it's not a first line therapy, but it can be an add on. And as much as possible, the allergy associations say, eh, just refer to an allergist, you know, don't, don't put this sort of stress on you, which is an easy thing to say again, from somewhere, if there's allergists all over the place, which, you know, in, in my neck of woods, there, there's, there's a bazillion allergists. You can't, you know, walk a block without running into an allergist. But again, as you get up to places where there's less access to specialty care, um, you know, it's just looking at the risks, looking at the benefit. These things are rare, but it, it's you want to make sure you've exhausted your other options first, whatever they may be. I have another question from Lisa. Is asthma hereditary? My grandfather and my mother both had asthma. My sisters and I do not, and neither do our children. However, with grandchildren hopefully coming soon, is there a possibility? Thanks. Yeah, asthma is an incredibly uh, hereditary, and it, but it doesn't usually skip generations like that. So maybe maybe you're okay. Um, if one parent has uh, asthma, it doubles your risk of developing asthma. If both parents have asthma, it quintuples your risk of having asthma. So there's a pretty strong signal um, in, in, the, in, in how hereditary it is. But there's a lot of other features that go into it. Another question from online. 
from Ethel, why is it some people get thrush due to using an inhaler even if they swish well? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I don't think we know. Um, it, it, there's just uh, the human body, the human immune system is incredibly complex. You know, why do some people, there's so many things you can point to where some people get, you know, an infection and go on to get rheumatic fever or, you know, toxic shock or, you know, why uh, two people who you wouldn't, you would think would both be healthy or something like COVID affects them drastically differently. Um, there's big genetic variations in innate immunity and adaptive immunity and prior exposures and environment and things like that. And it, and we don't really have an answer for that because it's not an easy thing to study. And it's also, you know, I, I think as we prioritize things, we're looking at it, it's never been prioritized to study it because it's an easy thing to see and it's an easy thing to fix. And it's a relatively rare thing. And so we just, we don't have an answer for that. Dr. Thomas, earlier in your talk, I think you, you talked about all the different types of inhalers and that becomes an issue sometimes when, you know, prescriptions have to change due to insurance and the latest and greatest new inhaler is different from the old one. Can you talk a little bit about the possibilities of maybe having that streamlined? Is that even a possibility? It, it seems like that may be some of the issue with adherence to um, medication. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, there was a big push from the American Thoracic Society and a lot of other people who are sort of involved in advocating for asthma to try and make it where all inhalers are the same. You take them the same way, it's the same number of puffs, you don't have to think about it. it doesn't matter if the inhaler gets changed, they always work the same. And unfortunately, um, you know, the, the companies making these medications actually have an incentive to do the opposite. Where as you change the way these inhalers work, you, you get a new patent and that extends the life uh, of the patented medication and you know, you can't use generics. And so that is why it has been, we've only had generic inhalers now for a couple of years, despite some of these medicines being 30 years old, because initially they were CFC based. And then when we had the bands of CFCs, they were able to um, adapt them to HFAs, which extended the patent. And then they tweaked it from, you know, being a puff to a breath actuated or a powder or something like that. Some of these medic medications have gone through three iterations of their brand name before. Now, finally, we're getting to the end of a you know, a patent cycle and starting to see some generics. And so um, it is, it, there's a lot of entrenched interests that have a lot more money than the pediatricians who uh, are able to sort of sway the way some of these things are happening. And, you know, it's unfortunate because it's an obvious thing to do. Like, well, why don't we make it less confusing? Maybe if confusion is a big problem and unfortunately we haven't gotten buy-in from the people who can actually make that kind of change. I have another question from online. Arlene asks, can extensive exposure to secondhand smoke cause asthma? Uh, yes. Yeah. So in children who grow up in homes of smoker, there's a substantial increased risk of developing asthma and the asthma becomes more severe and is more difficult to control. Um, smoke elimination is a you know, major uh, so it's something that we really focus on in households, with, uh, especially if the asthma is difficult to control because um, if you're constantly being exposed to an asthma trigger, it just makes things so, so difficult. And there's really good, um, there's some really interesting data that suggests not only is the smoke pro-inflammatory, but may in fact uh, uh, downregulate some of those receptors in the same way medication overuse was. It makes the medications less. So it's not, it, it's more than one thing that's happening when there's smoke exposure. Not seeing any more questions online. Um, I, I did have one question that came through and I, I typed an answer. Uh, there were some people asking if uh, a recording will become available. And yes, um, assuming we, we don't have any uh, technical issues, um, we post all of the Your Health Lecture Series recordings on uh, the Michigan State University College of Human Medicine um, YouTube page. and. Also, if you send me an email, I can send you a direct link as well. All right, well, thank you. And I just wanna, <laughs> go ahead. I just wanna thank uh, Northern Michigan University for being such great hosts again. Like Dr. Wynn said, this is our longest running Your Health Lecture Series event. And we always appreciate the hospitality here in Marquette. Um, also, thank you to UP Health System Marquette for their continued co-sponsorship. 
um, and Superior Health Foundation, and of course, uh, MSU College of Human Medicine. Thanks for coming.